Welcome to Go Red for Women. Jennifer and I are excited to support the Heart Association with this important conversation, how we work together to promote heart healthy living and eliminate disparities. I'm Peggy McGuire, the president of the Cambia Health Foundation and a longtime supporter of the American Heart Association. Jennifer, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Let's start by having you tell us a little bit about your background and what drew you to this work. Well, it's great to be here, Peggy. Wonderful to see you again. Congratulations to you and Cambia for making this program possible. And I would say as an AHA volunteer, fellow volunteer, I think partnership with the AHA to advance the Go Red for Women movement is of critical importance at this time. You know, you look at the statistics and you realize heart disease, in spite, you know, yes, we're dealing with the COVID epidemic, but heart disease is still the number one killer of women. And as per, per the American Heart Association, 80% of heart disease can be prevented. So I think it's critical at this time that we get women to realize their health is their most important asset and to refocus on doing the small things that can make a difference to have heart healthy living and to live a long and healthy life. I know you have really made a difference in many lives, but including my own. So about a year ago, you gave me this book that you authored or co-authored. Uh -huh. And um, it's for those, if you can't see it, it's called Heart Smart for Women. And it's six um, steps in six weeks to healthy heart living. Well, I received this book in my office back when, we, when I was working in my office. <laughs> And I was so touched to receive it. Um, it was just so kind of you to send this to me. And I immediately read it and took the recommendations to heart. Um, I, I lost um, 20 pounds. Awesome. And I got my waist circumference to the acceptable range. And I would just, I mean, it, and it wasn't hard. It was, you know, incorporating simple steps each week to become healthier. Um, and to really make that investment and prioritize my own health and well-being. So I thank you for that gift. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for the book. And I wonder if you can share with others, um, you know, some of the key recommendations that came from this book. A, a group of our patients inspired us to write this book. And so writing Heart Smart for Women, Six Steps in Six, six Weeks, was really meant to give women sort of a, a roadmap to, to what you can do. S is take stock, stock your pantry with healthy foods. So you get rid of all of the fry, the fatty, the um, foods that can live on the shelf for a long, long time. Those are the ones that really taste good, but definitely not good for the cardiovascular system. T is to take control of your activity and choose to move. And right. we want women to know that you can get your exercise or your activity in 10 minute increments, right? So if it's 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes at, at lunchtime, 10 minutes at night, it all adds up. The E from steps is to eat a healthy diet. And we offer choices of making your plate much more colorful, right? Portion control, going easy on the you know, small portions of protein, but lots of fruits and vegetables, and we highlight what you're supposed to do. We even offer recipes um, and suggestions. When you dine out at a restaurant, depending on the portion size, you can have, take half of it and package it for the next day. I was just gonna say one of the other things I loved from your book was in the eat section, in the E, was uh -huh. to um, institute meatless Mondays. Yes. And so make sure you're getting a lot of plants and whole foods into your diet. And so our family loves to say, okay, it's meatless Monday. So we'll have a, a vegetarian meal on Mondays and then incorporate more fish into yes. the diet as well. You and know, I'm here in the Northwest, salmon is very uh, big. And so we eat a lot of salmon and then we started the meatless Mondays as well. When we come to the P, we felt this was something that we needed to sort of emphasize. And the P is about partnership. And if you see yourself as a partner on the journey to heart healthy living, you partner with your, 
your doctor, your medical team. And being a partner means you have to share information. Also, the P highlights the partnership with family and friends. And Peggy, you just mentioned the family does meet last Monday. And so the partnership makes sure that, you know, that, that sort of um, saying, when women are healthy, families and villages and countries are healthy, you are sort of the chief medical officer of the family. So you put the family on the path to heart healthy living. So partnership is really important and taking that seriously. And yeah, and I love your idea of partnering with your um, doctor. Um, yes. on this journey. Uh, you're ultimately accountable for what you put in your body and how you yes. move your body, but having someone there to support you, whether it's family, friends, your doctor, or all of the above, it's a, that's a great, uh, great aspect of the book. As we go back to the book, the S, right? We feel you should sleep more, stress less. I want you to know that I instituted a 10 p.m. bedtime so I start winding things down around nine and start, you know, getting ready for bed. And my goal is to be in bed at 10. Not only are you an author, <laughs> but you're a filmmaker. And um, last year, the Cambia Health Foundation was honored to support the making of your film, Misdiagnosed. Mm -hmm. um, can you just tell us a little bit about the film and what um, prompted you to make it? And then... Um, what were some of the key takeaways? The timing was right for a call to action to highlight the misdiagnoses that occur when women, uh, symptoms are not recognized, when we don't have the, 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 the knowledge, the gender specific knowledge to make appropriate treatments. We discovered that a film like this, there were enough stories that could really be could bring attention to the fact that we needed more sex and gender research. We needed to ramp up awareness, you know, in partnership with the American Heart Association's Go Red for Women campaign. And that storytelling could issue a call to action for more allocation of research dollars to study the sex and gender um, aspects. Also importantly, we felt that we needed to empower women to truly be partners in their health. And so we set out to produce Misdiagnose. It was definitely a labor of love. And I want to say a huge thank you to you and your team, to Dr. Cheryl Pegas at Acambia. Um, we finished producing uh, just before and had everything ready before COVID started. We premiered, we had the world premiere at the Cinequest Film Festival in California. And then one day later, after the first or two showings, had to close down because of, of the quarantine for COVID. We have gotten into two other film festivals and we're waiting to figure out how we're going to be displayed. But what is interesting about the film, we highlight four stories of women who were misdiagnosed and they share the trials and tribulations, the challenges, the effect on their families that this misdiagnose, uh, you know, being misdiagnosed uh, led to and how it affected their lives. Can't wait till, till we can, um, you know, see it at a film festival. Um, is there any way people can watch a trailer now? So yes, on, on the misdiagnose uh, film.com website, you can actually see the trailer. Yes. So we're going to close the conversation pretty soon, but I want to ask you about the, in general, that topic of health disparities. And we have seen with COVID just the complete um, disparate impact that the disease has had in communities of color, in the Black community, in the Latinx community. And um, it, I think it just has surfaced a lot of disparities that we knew were there or that were lurking under the surface. They're now exposed. And uh, the question is really, where do we go from here? And how does someone like me, uh, an ally, really um, make a difference or contribute to, to the work? And I guess the question is, how can, how can I and my organization be a supporter to help reduce health disparities? 
You know, it's a great question. And I think, you know, you're already supporting by being part of the American Heart Association's Go Red for Women, you know, campaign and being involved because this is part of the mission of the American Heart Association to improve the cardiovascular health of all Americans, right? I think that, you know, COVID-19 unmasked in many ways the existing health disparities we knew. Um, also, I, I like to think of the Leonard Cohen um, exhibit that I saw, you know, on his famous, there's a crack in everything and that's how the light gets in. And I think that COVID-19 took, you know, unveiled really and, and allowed the light to come in and shine a light on the huge health disparities that exist, especially in the African-American, Black African-American and Latinx communities. Um, and I think what we need to do is, first of all, understand, right, that, you know, the, the health disparities that exist need, need to be addressed in a formalized way. It has to be a multi-pronged, all hands on deck approach. And I like the fact, you know, that you, you know, mentioned being an ally and, and an ally is someone who recognizes the problem, it makes it their mission and a part of the solution. And so, you know, there is no question that, you know, there are many determinants of health, um, you know, that affect uh, Black and African and uh, Latino communities. And when you look at the heart disease statistics, so we've been looking at the statistics, you know, for the past decade, you see the largest burden of cardiovascular disease, heart disease, strokes, uh, hypertension, lies with uh, Black and African American women. Highest, highest burden, the, the statistics tell us that. Then followed by African and Black American men, and then you see for Latinx as well. And when we start to figure out how to address these disparities and recognizing that as it relates to heart disease, 80% can be prevented, right? We have to look at all of the different steps. One is knowledge, right? And knowledge and education that is cust culturally customized to meet the needs of the communities. And the way to do this is community partnerships, right? So you partner with communities, train people as maybe community advocates and educators. And I think the American Heart Association is doing this and, and can be, can definitely do this. Really building a co community coalition. And it has to be a partnership where, you know, what matters, how can we fix it? You know, there are also structural changes, right, that, that need to be in place and understanding the determinants of health, you know, figuring out access to health care, access to education, things like preferred language. Um, what does someone speak at home? Health literacy. How are we communicating? Um, all of those factors uh, take, you know, come into play. So I, I think it it's, will be a journey you know, and understanding some of the components that have been built in structurally, um, you know, and recently the American Heart Association published, you know, and coming from JAMA as well, structural racism is a contributor to disparities in health. So collectively, we have to look at all of these and come up with solutions um, in partnership with our communities to, to address the disparities of health. But I think as it relates to cardiovascular disease, uh, an easy, you know, a, a low hanging fruit, it's culturally appropriate education, figuring out access to uh, medications, access to lifestyle changes, you know, people live in food deserts, let's, let's figure out who we can partner with, you know, when it's partnering with a whole food. So this is all about partnerships to come up with the solutions, right? And, and I feel building trust with our communities that have definitely uh, been overlooked, have had historically issues with trust in the medical communities. We have to be educated about that, accept that, and figure out ways to, to bridge the gap. So it's going to be a journey, and, and I applaud you and Cambia, the American Heart Association, for us now looking at this it, from a partnership point of view and solution point of view, figuring out what matters to our communities and coming up with solutions. This is a time, a time of reckoning, right? A time right. of uh, really um, trying to figure out where we want to be as a society, as a human being, as human beings. I think that rekindling and reigniting 
the basic humanism tenet is really important, you know? And I, and I think that if we could recognize, and we see this, recognize the, the human kindness and the human spirit and, and the heart of it all, right? You know, there's a recent reading in, in the, um, in the in the in the scriptures in the Torah last week's portion I, and I happen to know this from my husband that talked about having a heart right and if you do not have a heart that is probably one of the the worst things that can happen right and so for us all as human beings to reconnect to reconnect with with being empathetic walking in somebody else's shoes and having that generosity and kindness of spirit all of the components of humanism need to be rekindled, brought to the forefront, and can help us on, on the solution and the path to eliminating health disparities and having access for all. Well said, very well said. I think we'll end the uh, interview on those wise words. Um, thank you so much and um, really appreciate the conversation today and your um, passion and your advocacy. Thank you for all that you do, and thanks for being with us today. Um.